Hey everybody, Matt from 90thPercentile.ca here. For access to more study notes, practice questions, mock exams, and end chapter question videos, visit 90thPercentile.ca and sign up for your free trial today. Link below in the description. This learning module is understanding business cycles. I'm going to go pretty quick throughout this module. Um, really the key points here are outlining the four different business cycles or phases of the business cycle. So we have a recovery, an expansion, a slowdown, and a contraction. Um, the The curriculum goes a little bit too in depth, in my opinion. Um, and and basically, what it's trying to explain is how these different phases of the business cycle impact different metrics such as inflation, employment, business or consumer expectations about growth, investment, income, and spending. Generally, the way I like to think of it and, and to simplify it maybe a little bit too much, but generally all of these metrics that I just listed down below are going to follow the business cycle, right? So inflation going to be low down here at the peak. We're going to be accelerating at the trough. It's going to be low. Same thing with employment, you know, early stages of recovery. Employment's going to be low here. We're going to have employment very high. Same kind of thing, business expectations when we're starting to recover and we can see the upswing expectations are going to increase after we hit the peak, they're going to decrease. So it's the same thing across the board. Um, we're going to go into some specific questions that ask how different phases of the business cycle impact some of these, but generally the way I like to think about it is you know, just follows the cycle. Just keep it really simple. So with that, Let's get into the questions. As the expansion phase of the business cycle advances from early stage to late stage, businesses most likely experience a decrease in labor costs, capital investment, or availability of qualified workers. So we're going from the early stage to the late stage of an expansion. So it would be this part of the graph, which I kind of referenced before, It'd be this, this blue area where we're going up and if trend GDP is here, we have a gap, right? So we're, we're trending above potential or trend GDP. And this would result in a decrease in labor cost note in an expansion. There's going to be an upward pressure on labor costs. People are demanding more capital investment. Nope. If the economy is expanding, the company's going to be investing more. So we're left with availability of qualified workers, which is the answer. And you can kind of think of this as if you have unemployment as of this point, unemployment here is going to be higher than it is here. Here we're at essentially a low for unemployment. And due to that, as we go up this graph, there's going to be more and more people hired and the availability of the remaining workforce or people who don't have a job is going to decrease. Moving on, an analyst writes in an economic report that the current phase of the business cycle is characterized by accelerating inflationary pressures and borrowing by companies. The analyst is most likely referring to the peak of a business cycle, contraction phase of the business cycle, early expansion phase of the business cycle. So if we have accelerating inflationary pressures, that is not going to be the contraction phase because th that would be you know coming down here. In the contraction phase, we could still have inflation, but it wouldn't be accelerating. That's, that's the key word. And if we're looking at C, the early expansion phase, it, I mean, it, it it's between A and C. Um, the reason I'm leaning more towards A is because Borrowing by companies is typically the highest at the peak in, in, in C and A. Inflation should be rising, right? But inflation is at its highest at this point. And also in the early expansion phase, companies might not be as sure about the future economic growth. So they might not be borrowing as much. But at the peak, everything's firing on all cylinders. So that's why the answer is A. The inventory to sales ratio is most likely to be rising as a contraction unfolds partially into a recovery or near the top of an economic cycle. 
So this one's a bit tricky. It always messed me up a little bit when I was when I was studying. Um, to illustrate, I have once again our our business cycle graph. We have trend GDP as this line and actual GDP right here. So I like to divide it into two segments, one on the upswing and then one on the downswing. So dividing it right down the middle. And on the upswing here, the way I like to think about it is assuming a company is ordering the same amount of inventory all the time, we're going to have these impacts. So sales are going to be increasing because, you know, economy is going through an expansion, which means if we're ordering the same amount of inventory all the time, we're going to have less inventory on hand. And then on the downswing, sales are going to be decreasing, which means we have more inventory on hand. So where is this ratio going to be the highest? It's going to be the highest rate at the peak where sales drops the sharpest. So if sales drops, this entire ratio is going to be at its highest point, assuming you know, we're ordering the same amount of inventory all the time. So due to that, the inventory to sales ratio is most likely to be rising near the top of an economic cycle. If we're looking at partially into a recovery, it might be something like over here where sales are starting to increase, which you know the ratio would most likely be decreasing at this point. And then as a contraction unfolds, sales would be decreasing like right around here. Um, but the sharpest drop is actually right here, which is why this ratio is going to be the highest near the top. These questions go over some theories of the business cycle. So the CFA book mentions four separate theories. And really all these theories are trying to do is explain what causes business cycles. So in probably the most common one, the neoclassical model, it says that changes in business cycles or business cycles in general are, are a result of technology changes. So across all of these theories, just important to remember some of these keywords. Um, I, I found that as long as you know some of these keywords, you can, you know, figure out from the multiple choice which which one's most appropriate. We also have the Austrian th theory, which says that business cycles are due to misguided government intervention. So when you go, governments are either spending too much, taxing too much, taxing too little, all that. And then we have the Keynesian theory, which says that changes in business cycles are due to changes in business expectations. So expectations about future growth or slowdown. And then finally, we have the monetarist theory, which says that business cycles are due to either too rapid or too slow increases or decreases in the money supply. So this one kind of makes sense, right? Like monetarist, monetary policy, money supply. So from there, we can go and look at our questions. First one here, a national government response to a severe recession by funding numerous infrastructure projects using deficit spending. What school of economic thought is most consistent with, su with such action? So you would think it would be Austrian, but the key word here to remember from what I said is that it's due to, this thing was due to misguided government intervention. And also Austrian isn't even here on the list, so we can eliminate that. Monetarist, once again, is due to, is related to the money supply, so it's not that. Neoclassical is due to tech changes so it's not that either which leaves us with keynesian which is a little bit weird because we said you know business cycle business cycles are due to changes in business expectations but one key point about keynesian which we didn't mention is that it actually advocates it advocates for proper fiscal and monetary policy so whereas monetarist and Austrian are, you know, somewhat against, like Austrian is really against government intervention, monetarist is not necessarily pro-monetary policy. They they want it done in a way that is uh, a little bit more stable. But the one that really advocates for fiscal and monetary policy done properly is Keynesian. Next, the Austrian Economic School attributes the primary cause of the business cycle to, well, we went over it, misguided government intervention. And then the last one, according to the Austrian School, the most appropriate government response to an economic recession is to 
maintain, well, if we're coming to B, maintain steady growth in the money supply, nope, this is going to be monetarist. C, decrease the market rate of interest below its natural value, nope, once again, this is monetary policy. So really what the Austrian school is telling them to do is not do anything. And just let the market adjust naturally. When the spread between 10-year U.S. Treasury yields and the federal funds rate narrows, and at the same time the prime rate stays unchanged, this mix of indicators most likely forecast future economic growth, decline, or stability. So we have the 10-year yield, and we have the prime rate. So this is remaining unchanged, and this is decreasing. So these interest rates, the you know government interest rates or the yield on the on government rates are market driven, right? And these in, these interest rates are composed of one, the prime rate, because you know they obviously can't go below the prime rate, and then two, the expectations for future growth and inflation. So when growth and inflation are expected to rise, this rate is going to increase, which would increase the spread. But in this case, we have the 10 year declining, which is going to decrease the spread. So if the spread is declining, our expectations for future growth and inflation are declining. So it is forecasting a economic decline really quickly. Any of these market variables so like stock prices yields on bonds etc are all leading indicators um and and the thought process behind that is that you know the market is forecasting the future um and a lot of these prices like for example equity indexes will start to fall before the actual economy starts to fall very rapidly it's, it's usually determined or considered to be a leading indicator um, this whole concept of the spread decreasing is also related to when you hear about inverting yield curves forecasting a future economic recession you might have something like this where you have like a 10 year year yield here and you might have like a one year yield here so if the yield on the 10 year is less than the yield on the one year, that's because they're forecasting 10 years from now there's going to be you know, lower growth, lower inflation. Here we have some more questions relating to leading and lagging indicators. So the first one, which of the following indicators is most appropriate in predicting a turning point in the economy? If it's predicting, it has to be a leading indicator. So we can look at which of these three are a leading indicator. Is it the industrial production index? Nope. This is similar to CPI, which, which will be released every month. Just given you know that it's released every month, it's not that frequent. This is usually a lagging indicator, lagging indicator to see what happened the prior month. The average bank prime lending rate. Once again, this is a lagging indicator. This is usually changed by central banks in response to what's going on in the economy. So it's it's lagging. Then we have average weekly hours manufacturing, which is the answer, um, you know, given that the frequency is weekly and manufacturing is a key input in measuring the output of an economy. This is a you know, well looked at leading indicator. Next, we have the unemployment rate is considered a lagging indicator because new job types must be defined to count their workers. Nope, that's just, uh, you know, kind of a filler answer. Multi-worker households change, job, change jobs at a slower pace. Nope. Once again, kind of a filler. The, the, the textbook doesn't mention anything really about multi-worker households. This, this is just trying to throw you off. Um, the real answer, and you know, if you saw this one first, you pr could probably get it right, right away, is that businesses are slow to hire and fire due to related costs, right? So you take some time to hire employees, take some time to to fire employees. Um, if you're firing them, you might have to give severance, all that. So there's some stickiness to, to labor. And then finally, during an economic recovery, a lagging unemployment rate is most likely attributable to 
businesses quickly rehiring workers. Nope, that doesn't really happen in practice. New job seekers entering the labor force. Yeah, this is it. So it usually takes some time for these job seekers to actually find the job, sign the job, all that. So the unemployment rate, despite the economy booming, is going to take some time to, to really decrease. The least likely consequence of a period of hyperinflation is the reduced velocity of money, increased supply of money, or a possibility of social unrest. So during a period of hyperinflation where, you know, inflation is completely skyrocketing, like 100% a day, um, there's been some instances and some examples of countries experience, experiencing this over the last 50 to 100 years. Um, and in this case, what's what usually happens is day to day, it, it, it's not a secret that inflation is, is through the roof. Everyone knows it. Um, so what people are going to do is they're just going to keep spending everything they have right now because they know in two days from now, a week from now, their money's going to be worth less than it was at that point, material, materially less than it was. So this is actually going to increase the velocity of money because people are spending more and more and more and more and more and more. Um, so money's going to switch hands a lot a lot quicker than it was than it would in a period of, of normal inflation the inflation rate most likely relied on to determine public economic policy so monetary and fiscal policy is core inflation headline inflation or the index of food and energy prices so let's just get rid of this this isn't used beyond all that um so the difference between core inflation and headline inflation headline inflation is what you'll you know see in the news or see in headlines and headline inflation includes food and energy prices. And this leads to more volatility. In the inflation measure, right? Because, you know, we know how volatile oil prices can be, especially food, not as much, but and but oil in particular is, is very volatile. Um, so whenever central banks or governments are looking to enact economic policy to look at core inflation which excludes food and energy this is less volatile so it, it'll lead to less drastic economic policy measures last question here we have an economist expecting the following a decline in the unemployment rate resulting in higher revenues for home retailers a tighter labor market will put upward pressure on wages compelling home retailers to raise prices which type of inflation best corresponds to the economist's expectations? So we have stagflation, cost push, cost push inflation, and demand pull inflation. So the main difference between these two, cost push inflation is inflation or higher prices, right? Relative to the long run equ equilibrium, which is driven by a decrease in aggregate supply, right? Whereas, on the flip side of that, we have demand pull inflation, which is caused by an increase in aggregate demand leading to higher prices. So cost, cost push driven by aggregate supply, demand pull driven by aggregate demand. Here we have a tighter labor market putting upward pressure on wages. So this is related to aggregate supply, right? So we can cross this one out right away. Then we're left with stagflation and cost push inflation it, it could be stagflation right like we previously went over this so stagflation would be over here higher prices with lower growth the reason why it's not stagflation is because stagflation also has high unemployment but the economist is saying decline in unemployment which leaves our only answer to be b 